This morning, we're starting a brand new series of messages that'll take us all the way through the summer. And our focus will be on what it means to live by the Holy Spirit. In other words, we're going to look at how we can choose to show the world that the Spirit is alive and well and resting upon us. And I'm saying us as both individuals and as the church. And to do that, we're going to use a passage from Paul's letter to the Galatians as, a, as kind of a, a guide and talk about what he called the fruit of the Spirit. He wrote, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, gentleness and self-control. There, are no, there is no law against such things. But all that positive stuff, well, we'll start considering that next week. This morning, we're going to do something a little different. You see, we're going to focus on what Paul had just talked about, you know, that caused him to write by contrast. In other words, this morning, we're going to look at the opposite of all these wonderful, wonderful fruits. The uh, stuff we're not supposed to do, something Paul calls the desires of the flesh. And, you know, since it really is the opposite of what he wants us to do, it's actually like living by the Spirit in a place called the bizarro world. Now, does anybody here know what I'm talking about when I say bizarro world? Well, if you don't, just check this out. Because I think this little video explains it far better than I could. He's reliable, he's considerate, he's like your exact opposite. So he's Bizarro Jerry. Bizarro Jerry? Yeah, like Bizarro Superman. Superman's exact opposite, who lives in the backwards Bizarro world. Up is down, down is up. He says hello when he leaves, goodbye when he arrives. Shouldn't he say bad bye? Isn't that the opposite of goodbye? No, it's still goodbye. Does he live underwater? No. Is he black? Look, just forget the whole thing, all right? The team of miniatures was amazing. No, he's so tiny. Hey, hey guys. Elaine, sit down. These are a couple of my friends. Uh, this is Gene, and this guy we just call Feldman. <laughs> Of course, if you've seen the episode or know anything about Seinfeld, one of my favorite shows, you understand exactly what's going on here. Elaine has met three new friends. And since they are dependable, and they are sensitive, and they are intellectual, Kevin, Jean, and Feldman are the bizarre world's version of Jerry, George, and Kramer. In other words, they're the exact opposite. And in a real way, I think that's what Paul was warning the Galatians. And, by the way, he was warning us. When he wrote, live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For those are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I'm warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, doing this kind of stuff is the exact opposite of what Paul thought Christians should be doing. And in that way, it really is like living by the Spirit in the bizarro world. But even though this lifestyle is diametrically opposed to the kind of lives we've been called to live, it's not only tempting, but really easy for us to do. 
And I'll tell you, I think the Apostle Paul would agree with both. You see, for him, the reason it happens, the reason we drift in this direction, the reason we gratify the desires of the flesh, especially Christians, well, it all started when Jesus died on the cross. I mean, just listen to what Paul wrote to the Romans, and I'm reading this from the contemporary English version. That is how it is with you, my friends. You are now part of the body of Christ and, listen to this, are dead to the power of the law. You are free to belong to Christ who was raised to life so that we could serve God. When we thought only of ourselves, the law made us have sinful desires. It made every part of our bodies into slaves who are doomed to die. But the law no longer rules over us. We are like dead people. And it cannot have any power over us. Now, we can serve God in a new way, by obeying his spirit, and not in the old way, by obeying, by obeying the written law. Now, that's what he wrote. And I want you to just think about what that means. Through Jesus Christ, we have been set free. And I'm talking about we've been set free from all those rules and regulations that folks believe will make them okay in the sight of God. We have been set free. As he wrote a little bit later in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and of death. You see, thanks to the cross, we're free. Now that's our condition. Therefore, Paul meant it when he wrote right before our passage, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Now, I don't care how you cut it, this is good news. Man, we are free. We are free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. But right here's the problem. Since we're free from the law that kept us, well, how do you want to put it? it kept us on a short leash when we were bound. Now, we're now free to make some really bad decisions. The law kept us constrained. Now we're free so we can do all sorts of crazy stuff. In other words, we're absolutely free to misuse the freedom that we have. Remember, Adolf Hitler was elected in a democratic election. We can misuse our freedom. It's sort of like a new scooper at an ice cream parlor who's told that he can eat as much ice cream as he wants and he eats so much he throws up. That's the kind of freedom we have. And I think that's what Paul understood when he wrote about standing firm and not becoming slaves again. In fact, this is the very thing he talked about just a little later in Galatians. He wrote, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. You see, Paul recognized that as free men and women, we can take this precious freedom, we can take this wonderful gift that God has given us, and we can pervert it. We can misuse it. I mean, we can turn it and we can distort it in order to indulge ourselves. You know, to make ourselves happy, to do what we want to do. Something that, doggone it, sinners just love to do. And you know, that's exactly why after all this freedom stuff, Paul warned the Galatians to live by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not subject to the law. 
You see, if our abuse of the freedom we've been given, if we abuse that freedom, I'm telling you, that's the reason we end up drifting into this spiritual, bizarro world. And how can we know it's happening? How can we know that we're doing this? Well, that becomes obvious in the lives we're living. Something that Paul made crystal clear when he wrote, and again, this is from the contemporary English translation, people's desires make them give in to immoral ways, filthy thoughts, and shameful deeds. They worship idols, practice witchcraft, hate others. They are hard to get along with. People become jealous, angry, and selfish. They do, they not only argue and cause trouble, but they are envious. They get drunk, carry on at wild parties, and do other evil things as well. I told you before, and I'm telling you again, no one who does these things will share in the blessings of God's kingdom. Now, in my book, that's a pretty good list. Or your average day at a Rudiger family reunion. Just kidding. In fact, this is not different than another list that Paul offered, this time to the Romans. And if you thought the first list, the one to the Galatians, was bad, just get a load of this. These people, that's what he writes, these people refused even to think about God. They let their useless minds rule over them. That's why they do all sorts of indecent things. They are evil, wicked, and greedy, as well as mean in every possible way. They want what others have. They murder, argue, cheat, and are hard to get along with. They gossip, say cruel things about others, and hate God. They are proud, conceited, and boastful, always thinking up new ways to do evil. These people don't respect their parents. They are stupid, unreliable, and don't have any love or pity for others. They know God has said that anyone who acts in this way deserves to die, but they keep on doing evil things, and they even encourage others to do them. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, well, I, 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 uh, 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 I, I, I think I'm okay. I mean, I've never practiced witchcraft. Um, and I did have that Ouija board when I was a kid, but never really practiced witchcraft, and I've never committed murder, and, and so I must be okay. I want you to think again. Now, don't get me wrong. Even if we do all this crazy stuff, I believe we are still loved by God. Because remember, nothing can separate us from his love, including our misuse of the freedom we've been given. But if you found yourself putting a check by some of those characteristics, you know, and then trying to come up with reasons why some others don't technically apply. I mean, technically it wasn't a lie. I mean, it, technically it wasn't. You know, if you read it in this certain way, it kind of looks like it might possibly in another universe be true. If that's what you started to do, well, I think you're probably showing some pretty strong signs that in spiritual terms, you should start your prayers by saying, Amen. Because I'm telling you, that's the kind of world in which you live, bizarro. And you know, if these signs aren't bad enough, the results of this kind of life, man, they're even worse. You see, if we've made up our minds to take this freedom God has given us and misuse it, and it really is our decision, and if we end up showing all these signs, or at least some of them, you know, the signs that comes from the choice to live in the flesh and not by the Spirit. I'm telling you, this decision always carries two consequences. I mean, first, we're going to experience a separation with God. Now, before I go any further, I want to be clear about this. God never separates himself from us. He's always present and he always loves and there's nothing we can do about that. That's just the way it is. But you know, we can separate ourselves from him, or maybe better, we can feel separated from his love and his grace. And I'll tell you, that's a pretty lonely place to be. In fact, this is how Paul described it in his letter to the Romans. And now I'm reading from Eugene Peterson's The Message. But God's angry displeasure erupts as acts of human mistrust and wrongdoing and lying accumulate as people try to put a shroud over truth. 
But the basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes and there it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes as such cannot see. Eternal power, for instance. And the mystery of the divine being. So no one has a good excuse. What happened is that was this. People knew God perfectly well. But when they didn't treat him like God, refusing to worship him, they trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion so that there was neither sense nor direction left in their lives. They pretended to know it all, but were illiterate regarding life. They traded the glory of God who holds the whole world in his hands for cheap figurines you can buy at any roadside stand. So God said, in effect, if that's what you want, that's what you get. It wasn't long before they were living in a pig pen, smeared with filth, filthy inside and out. And all this because they traded the true God for a fake God and worshipped the God they made instead of the God who made them. The God he bl we bless, the God who blesses us. Oh, yes. You see, the first result of chasing after the flesh is separation from God. And second, there's also a break in the relationships we have with one another. I mean, just consider most of the sign offered in Paul's list. You remember that wonderful, glorious list? And I'm thinking about actions, you know, like arguing and cheating, gossiping and bragging. And attitudes, like being jealous and selfish, conceited and unreliable. Now, you tell me, how can you have a genuine relationship? How can you have anything close to a friendship with a person who's always saying cruel things about others, including you, but probably not to your face, and who doesn't have any love or pity for those around them? How are you going to be a friend to that person? You going to pick them out of a group? I'll tell you, I think the result of living this kind of life will always lead to separation. And I'm talking about separation from God and from others. And I believe that's the reason why the Apostle Paul, before he started talking about what life by the Spirit was all about, you know, the kind of lives he wanted his people to live, he was very clear about the lifestyle they should avoid, something he called the desires of the flesh. And for him, the reason folks tend to drift in that direction involved an abuse of the freedom that God had given them, and the signs that is happening are universally negative, and the results always involve broken relationships, first with God and then with one another. That was his message to them, and through them, it's his message to us. And for that reason, he told the Galatians, and he tells us, to live by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh, unless, that is, you're living by the Spirit in bizarro world. Amen.